Uh, hello. Uh, today we'll pay homage uh, to two architects, um, uh, neo-Gothic uh, architect, uh, very, very important from, from Great Britain, uh, Augustus uh, Pugin, and a Dutch architect, um, Jan Duiker, a modern, uh, a modern architect. But let's begin with Pugin. And let's read a little bit what was written by Rosemary Hill uh, uh, in, in The Guardian. Um, the title of the article is Pugin, God's Architect. So Augustus, uh, he has two other names, uh, who, which I didn't memorize. Pugin's book, Contrasts, written in 1836, was the first architectural manifesto and had a profound influence on the next three generations of urban designers. Well, when, when urban designers, architects and uh, designers and so on. So Pugin was born in London on March 1st, 1812. Uh, so that's 210 years ago, was only 24 when he published Contrasts. It was the book that made his name and was the first architectural manifesto. So this is very interesting that apparently the first architectural manifesto was actually a manifesto, uh, not for men in a way, but for God. And you'll understand why. Uh, sorry, I, uh, there are these advertising. See, I'm trying to eliminate them. So prior to that, there had been treatising on building, going back to Vitruvius, texts that set out rules for proportion aesthetics and uh, construction. Contrasts, as its many critics were quick to point out, had little to say on these subjects. What Pugin offered his readers instead was an entire social program, one which redefined architecture as a moral force imbued with political and religious meaning. Published on the eve of the Victorian age, Pugin's polemic was an early rehearsal of a theme that was to echo through the 19th century and return to haunt the 21st century, the problems of the modern city. In 1836, the year of the book's publication, the question was still new. Men and women had never lived together in such vast numbers before, and as industry developed, and drew more workers from the country to the towns, so the mills and factories, warehouses, workhouses, and slum terraces spread. Ten years later, earlier, the Prussian architect Karl Friedrich Schinkel in Britain to carry out some discreet industrial espionage, I didn't know about this, had been horrified by the lack of planning, the monstrous, shapeless buildings put up only by foremen without architecture and the potential in these chaotic, chaotic streets for disorder. A decade later, the British began to understand what Schinkel had meant. The intervening years had seen the first outbreaks of cholera and some of the worst civil unrest, unrest in their history. At Bristol, the Bishop's Palace had been burned down by rioters and Nottingham, the castle had been destroyed. Pugin's message was simple. If there is something wrong with our cities, then there is something wrong with ourselves. And society and architecture both need reform. His pro prescription was a characteristic mixture of the romantic and the pragmatic, a proposal which at any other moment in history would have seemed fantastic, but one which caught the brittle mood of the mid 1830s. Contrasts argued for a revival of medieval Gothic architecture and with it a return to the faith and the social structures of the Middle Ages. While the text begged as many questions as might be expected for such a thesis, the pictures were per persuas a persuasive exercise in graphic polemic. Each plate took a single urban building type and compared the modern example with its 15th century equivalent. Thus, a picture of a late Georgian inn cobbled together inconveniently from a row of terraced houses 
and sit behind sharp iron railings set next to one of the Angel Hotel in Grantham with its welcoming bow windows and promising beer cellar. London University, founded in the, the year that the book was released, was represented by King's College in the Strand. Its neoclassical gateway, squeezed between houses, looked mean beside the mighty front of Christ Church, Oxford. The drawings were all calculatedly unfair. King's was shown from an unflatteringly skewed, skewed angle, and Christ Church was edited to avoid showing its famous Tom Tower because that was by Christopher Wren and so not medieval. But the cumulative rhetorical force was tremendous. Pugin had struck at a moment when the architectural establishment was coming under critical scrutiny. The stucco floor fronted neoclassicism of the Re Regency pillar pilloried in contrast was looking tired. Increasingly, it seemed to represent an age of decadence and waste of public money. John Nash, its most eminent exponent, had died the year before in disgrace, having been unable to account for the huge overspend on Buckingham, Buckingham's palace. A public inquiry had failed to establish the exact cost of George the Fourth lavish refurbishment of Windsor Castle, Windsor Castle. While Pugin was planning contrast, this simmering resentment against a closed and self-serving architectural establishment came to a head late on one October afternoon in 1834 when the palace of Westminster caught fire. The blaze turned out to be the last great show of Georgian London, watched by a vast crowd which included Pugin and Turner, who painted it. As the Office of Works moved slow, swiftly to bring in one of its architects for the rebuilding, public opinion rebelled. If, the, if there was to be a new seat of government, it should mark a new start for architecture as well as parliament. As the Morn, Morning Herald put it, this time the British people intend to have the choosing of the architects. The competition designs and the inevitable row that surrounded the final selection of Charles Barry's Gothic scheme was the context in which contrasts, the, the, the work by Pugin emerged to popular accl acclaim. At the time, however, despite his claims for architectural omniscience, Pugin was little more than a draftsman. One of his more lucrative jobs had been to provide the decorative details for Barry's winning Westminster design, and he was to return to work on the palace from time to time for the rest of his life. Over the years, he designed some of its most successful elements, including the interior of the House of Lords. Now, however, the success of Puget's manifesto launched him as an architect in his own right, and he set out about rebuilding Britain as a Gothic Catholic Christendom. It was a chaotic crusade, but one in which he came closer to success than might ever have been expected. By the time Pugin was 30, he had built 22 churches, three cathedrals, three convents, half a dozen houses, several schools, and the Cisternian monastery. He carried the battle into the heart of the industrial cities, the inexhaustible mines of bad taste at Birmingham and Sheffield, infested with Greek buildings, smoking chimneys, radicals, and dissenters. St. Charles, his Birmingham church, built among the squalor of the gunmaker's quarter, became England's first cathedral since Rennes St. Paul's. At the laying of the foundation stone, Pugin announced that he would not rest until the cathedral bells drowned out the steam whistle and the proving, the proving of the gun barrels. Politically, he might best be described as a conservative radical. He wanted to reform society. 
by returning it to a benign hierarchy, an idealized medievalism in which class could look upwards for support and would accept responsibility for those below them. It was the indifference of the modern city that appelled him. In 1841, he published a second edition of Contrasts, to which he added two new plates that developed the argument beyond individual buildings to present a whole moral panorama. One showed contrasted cities, the other contrasted residences for the poor. In the first, the medieval city, with its graceful spires and safe defensive walls, set beside its modern equivalent, the walls broken down, the spires ruinous, and the horizon dominated by kilns and factories. Its point was simple enough that, that we build most solidly in the areas of life in which we invest most of ourselves. The contrasted residences of the poor made a subtle case for the relationship between architecture and ideas. Here, Pugin compared the monastic foundation of the Middle Ages, where monks fed and clothed the needy, grew food in the gardens, and in the fullness of time gave the dead a decent burial. With a panopticon workhouse where the poor were beaten, half starved, and sent off after death for dissect dissection. Dissection. Each structure was the built expression of a particular uh, view of humanity. Christianity versus utilitarianism. Again, he hit home. The workhouses created under the new poor law trouble many Victorian consciences. consciences. To the rising generation of architects, these images acted as a call to arms. George Gilbert Scott remembered being awakened by Pugin to the possibility for architecture to deliver human dignity. Two year, 10 years later, at the great exhibition, Pugin was able to offer the public some answers to the question, questions that contrasts had raised. To furnish his buildings, he had designed a complete range of Gothic furnishings, furnishing sacred, secular and domestic, and many of them available to order at relatively modest prices. Seen together in the Crystal Palace, his plain flat pack tables, colorful dinner plates, and ceramic garden seats arranged beside stained glass and vestments held out a vision of the good life in the modern city, one that combined God with hearth and home and was deeply appealing to the mid-Victorian mind. The great, uh, great exhibition, you remember the uh, Crystal Palace uh, by Joseph Paxton and so on, should have been Pugin's moment of triumph. But by the time it opened, he was fatally ill and disillusioned. He had been in some ways too influential for his own good. Imitators, many cheaper and all of them easier going, had poached much of his architectural practice. His work for Barry at Westminster had become a poorly paid treadmill. By a sad irony, the, la the last design he ever made in January 1852 was destined to be his most famous. It was for the clock tower of the palace of Westminster. Days later, he lapsed into psychosis and died in September at in a, a aged um, uh, 40. The clock tower, which everybody knows, remains his most preeminent memorial, but his more important legacy is in the solid civic centers of Victorian towns, the urban churches, local schools, and middle-sized family houses built by the next three generations of architects who had been inspired by contrasts to try and bring humanity and coherence to the city. Now, sorry about this uh, rather long uh, text. Now we'll go to my presentation. And he was indeed a, a, an inspiring um, presence in architecture. And uh, it is my pleasure to say a few things about him. So Augustus Pugin, 1812, 1852. 
So he was born 2000, uh, 210 years um, earlier and he died 170 years earlier. So Augustus, well, they are, well by Northmoor Pugin, born as you can see on March 1st, 1812, was an English architect, designer, artist, and critic who is principally remembered for his pioneering role in the Gothic revival style of architecture. His work culminated in designing the interior of the Palace of West Westminster in Westminster, London, England, and its iconic clock tower, later renamed the Elizabeth Tower, which houses the bell known as Big Ben. Pugin designed many churches in England and some in Ireland and Australia. He was the son of Auguste Pugin and the father of Edward Elby Pugin and Peter Ball Pugin, who continued his architectural firm as Pugin and Pugin. He also created Alton Castle in Alton, Staffordshire. So here is a graphic work with uh, him and the famous uh, uh, you know, clock on the famous tower. Let's read again. It's called the Bean, Big Ben. Uh, a uh, romantic figure, you know, uh, fighting for bringing back God in our lives in a, in a serious and exalted way. Uh, here is a portrait of Pugin. Again, he died at 40, but by 40, he built many, many churches and cathedrals and schools and houses and so on. The true principles of pointed or Christian architecture. He was a medievalist uh, living in the wrong century. Uh, and uh, I don't know about his attempt to, um, to, 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 to unite, um, you know, spirit with uh, utilitarianism. I don't think it's easily possible. He believed in it, but uh, I, I'm not sure that it was possible when, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution kind of began to talk about God in, uh, in, uh, in a Gothic way. He tried an apology for the revival of Christian architecture. And here it is. He would have filled the whole town and the whole city with churches and churches and churches. Hopefully not corrupted churches. He was a, a, an exalted spirit. He believed in what he uh, when he uh, in what he advocated. So here is a drawing by him, and I think it's a very nice pencil drawing, uh, despite it's not so excellent uh, state that it was photographed in. But it's it's still a, a, you can tell a skillful drawing. He designed many things. He uh, not just buildings, but also uh, ornaments and uh, furniture. Uh, we'll see some of his uh, beautiful ornamental designs. He was a dreamer, of course, and unfortunately he died at 40 as a dreamer. Um, the the neo-Gothic or the Gothic revival in Great Britain was indeed a very uh, powerful movement and Victorian architecture is, uh, is remarkable. So his influence on, 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 on uh, British uh, architecture was uh, significant. And I would say uh, needs applauses from us because it, it is uh, in many cases uh, quite remarkable. I'm not usually uh, advocating the cause of any revivalism, but there was something about the, the Gothic revival uh, uh, in uh, in Great Britain, which I think uh, deserves appreciation. Now, was this him, or is this some kind of a you know, a, you know a representation of a of a you know a, a humble uh, anonymous worker uh, building the cathedral? Um, we need well. It's probably difficult to, to uh, recall, so to speak, uh, that kind of exuberance in building uh, the cathedral. But even uh, Walter Gropius in his money, short manifesto um, uh, for the Bauhaus was pointing in that direction. And in fact, the graphic representation of uh, 
of the manifesto by by uh, Walter Gropius represented nothing else than what they called or uh, Lionel Feininger who designed it who drew it the cathedral of socialism well the cathedral of socialism must have been a different cathedral than the so-called cathedral built by uh, you know uh, real time uh, so-called socialism that we experienced um, in the second half of the 20th century. Anyway, back to Pugin, uh, where he loved to draw and he didn't draw digitally, of course. Now the Palace of Westminster in London, we all know it. He worked with Barry, he, was, he didn't work alone. He was rather, rather you know, uh, the second man there uh, at most, but he, he influenced uh, the aesthetics of this famous uh, place in London significantly. The Scarbrick, Scarbrick Hall, um, designed by uh, Pugin. And uh, I mean, just this building, if an architect today would build just, just a building like this one, uh, would, would feel rather accomplished. But he built many. I, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I think he built 40 churches and cathedrals, 40 and in uh, less than 20 years, because he died at 40. So Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin, they uh, did this um, most important work for London. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody knows it. Uh, so the, the, the exalted uh, Gothicist uh, did something very, very useful, even in the secular field for uh, London and for Great Britain and actually for the world. This is just an introduction to, to Augustus Pugin. Uh, he deserves more, uh, more study and, uh, and I'm sure, I, I hope uh, by next year, I will be able to amplify uh, my, uh, my presentation about him. Now the big ban, which I uh, I mentioned already, it's uh, it's the big uh, clock on this famous tower in London. Um, he probably uh, collaborated with some uh, craftsmen and even engineers, uh, but uh, the aesthetics of everything here belong to him, and uh, I think they are appealing today as they were appealing. Uh, at the time when 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 it was built, the truth of the matter, this uh, Gothic revival uh, architecture is uh, not without charm, and uh, it doesn't matter how so-called modern you are. This is an architecture which uh, uh, still impresses, uh, and it's, if it is monumental, it's also sensitive. So you see here what they did. Charles Barry did the, the, the action, but uh, I think there were so they collaborated. I understood that uh, for uh, more than 15 years, Pugin would work on and off uh, on this uh, on this project. But apparently, this belongs to him. The, uh, the at least this part of the tower, but uh, he had also he worked on the interior. Uh, of this building and uh, on, on, on many things. Anyway, he was part of the team. From what I read, actually, Charles Barry perhaps was not uh, truly, uh, you know, very strong in terms of design. Pugin had an influence here, uh, a significant influence, although he was young. Uh, here are some, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, cleaning up the giant, this clock, as you can see. Uh, it uh, it uh, brought emotion to me this picture to, to realize that we know we'll see it like this, but uh, but look at the scale. Now, a Catholic Church. I only show some a few works by uh, Pugin in this um, in this presentation. Uh, you know, again, 
if an architect would build just this building and would feel accomplished, but he built around 40 just churches, besides many other kinds of buildings and by 40, yes, by 40. Uh, yes, from a modernistic uh, point of view or position, uh, maybe this architecture is a little bit uh, passive. Let's call it this so. But, but I think uh, Gothic, uh, a certain kind of Gothic revivalism or revival can be discerned in, in uh, contemporary architecture in various uh, uh, places. You know, Calatrava, sometimes his structures have uh, something so-called Gothic. Um, not the only one. The, the, there are other architects today who it seems this, uh, this influence coming from, from uh, uh, before the Renaissance uh, can, be, uh, can be discerned even today. And I'm glad it can, because I think uh, um, there are valuable uh, inspirations and lessons coming from there. Another valuable inspiration uh, coming from there is the, the, uh, the, the new interest in the ornament. We had enough, I mean, enough is enough. An architecture without ornament is like a tree without leaves and flowers in the spring. It's exactly the same thing. And uh, I understand uh, Adolf Loos, I understand certain uh, uh, simplifications that, that were corrections actually, that were needed at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. But we, we live now 100 years later, at least. Things change. And ornament brings to a building, if it's um, genuine and heartfelt and sensitively done, it brings to a building exactly this sensitivity. Bare walls are bare walls. And OK, maybe this is too sweet, too literal for our taste today, I would understand. Still, ornament, if it's uh, again heartfelt and genuine and uh, skillfully done, is uh, a, a good contribution to architecture. It doesn't have to be this way because we don't believe any longer in narration. We don't believe any longer in, uh, you know, uh, of course, this is a sacred building, but here there are, you know, literal. Uh, uh, figurations that refer to the narration of the people, you know, in this case, the person who is uh, housed in this Domus Eterna. St. Mary's Cathedral in Sydney, designed by Augustus Pugin. So this is actually in Sydney, in Australia. But look at this building. Is it a bad building? I don't think so. Okay, it's not Chartres Cathedral was not built in the 12th century, it was built in the 19th century, but I still think it has dignity and beauty and as such, it deserves to be acknowledged and applauded. Design two of our landmark properties, the, the Grange and the, in, in Surrey. This is, um, well, anyway, this text, uh, I, I don't know what happened here. I, 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 uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Um, I should have had some pictures and I don't. Uh, and look at this church. You know, it's a, it's a country church. It's a rural church. But I, I actually salute even its modernity. You know, and the, even if I said what I said about ornaments, this building doesn't have ornaments towards the outside. It's quite, uh, quite uh, sculptural and in a modern, modern way almost. It's vigorous. Inside, perhaps, uh, the sensitivity of uh, ornamental design is present, but towards the outside is quite, uh, I, I would call it uh, modernistic. Uh, and uh, if it wasn't the texture or the tectonic, uh, the tectonics of the materials he used, it would have been even more so. I like rural churches uh, anywhere in the world, because I think those rural small churches are closer to the earth and are closer to that beginning, which Louis Kahn thought is always in, the, in harmony with the human spirit, and it's closer to nature.
as you can see. Uh, another church, um, a smaller church, but still, you know, uh, even if here the, the innovation is not, uh, you know, obvious, I still think such buildings have uh, bring dignity to their communities and to the places they are in. Who cares that the elements uh, elements affected the building? Quite the opposite. I think the elements brought the passage of time to, to the building and uh, gave it an additional um, uh, quality, perhaps. Anyway, it's, it's moving. And, you know, in the end, or as the saying goes, at the end of the day, what matters? This man built for God. Uh, and uh, built uh, significantly and wrote about it and fought for it. He succeeded, uh, I'm not so sure about, but he did succeed in, in Great Britain in the 19th century. But, you know, uh, of course, the assault on, on spirit uh, was uh, massive and continues to be massive. A round tower attached to a church at home of this, uh, whatever. Again, it's a ruin, but for the spirit, as Cantacuzino would have said, referring to the, uh, to the columns of Persepolis, for the spirit is enough. What I see here warms my heart. And it's just a ruin. But, uh, and even if I didn't know as, uh, the building was built by Pugin, I still would have liked it. Now, tiles designed by Puget between 1845 and 1851. He died in 1852. Uh, yes, they are not uh, idiosyncratic. They, are, they believe in symmetry, in uh, figuration. But I think, I think even if you don't have a nostalgic state of mind, um, they are... They are, they are nice, to say the least. Uh, maybe the word nice is too sweet and not adequate, and I apologize for it. How could we bring this kind of sensitivity into the present? I'm not very sure. But uh, here was a spirit that uh, lived in the 19th century, but had his uh, uh, inspiration uh, somewhere else. Now, ornamental designs. Well, what was before was also, in a way, ornamental design. Here we see more of it. We see what is not taught in schools any longer. I mean, uh, we impoverished architecture incredibly. You know, we think architecture is just about space and white walls and glass. The more glass, the better. That's all. That's all that architecture is for us today. And it's not like this. I mean, here in, a, in, a, in the smallest detail, there is more richness than in a whole building built today. Architecture is not just about space and it's not even about space as uh, uh, Vito Acconci said, but he was not the only one. It's about time. <laughs> Whatever Bruno Tsevi might say. Now look here, you know, these are just details and they are drawn. But no one could contest that there is uh, something very interesting here, you know, and rewarding for the eye and for the soul. Pugin's Gothic Ornament, the classic source book of decorative motifs by Augustus Charles Pugin. Um, and the funny thing is that we can actually do such things very easily today with all the, the, the technological tools and gadgets we have at our disposal. They don't have to be so uh, sweet. We can work differently, but, but, but again, the idea to bring back ornament, I don't think, and it's not just about the ornament as a graphic uh, device. It's also about weaving. Because Godfrey Semper was correct when he said that the first architectural gesture actually was weaving. 
and he co he connects this thought that he had with the first with the deepest with the oldest etymological root of the word architect and that is text t e k s which in the the indo-european language meant to weave to weave and what what is the relevance of weaving to architecture well uh, Godfrey semper said it very simply the first man on earth who built their first hut or the first building they gathered around the fire they returned from work from hunting and fishing they didn't have yet a home they didn't have tools to cut down trees to create the structure so they moved vegetable material from bushes from trees from whatever they removed them by hand without tools and they started to weave them and thus they created the first uh, um, panel kind of a flexible uh, wall you know from vegetable material that was done through weaving and it's in the very word architect the uh, uh, you know uh, text present because architecture texture comes from texture comes from text which means to weave and when you weave just as uh, someone uh, weaves a sweater ornament comes naturally into being that's why most people who still weave or embroider something they bring in ornament naturally it comes natural to them so there is a connection between weaving and ornament i call this the feminization of architecture and to weave all the goddesses of uh, weaving and there were such goddesses in ancient mythology were women and uh, there were such goddesses and i knew i i know them by hand by 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 name uh, so text actually refers to weaving and refers to the feminine side of architecture which unfortunately was neglected for too long but it should come back and Pugin was working in this direction he was not the only one of course in the 19th century here is a series of 31 designs floriated ornament by by him it's a book he published many books uh, and uh, you know again they might seem to us cynical as we are it's too sweet too nostalgic you know some I, someone might call them uh, gingerbread for gingerbread houses no no i would say these yes they have a sweetness about them but they represent a different kind of sensibility of course how could you do something like this when mr putin is bombing at this very moment ukraine with bombs not to speak about the nuclear bombs so indeed how could you do something like this when on the sky there are uh, criminal uh, planes flying with deadly bombs uh, ready to be deployed so yes this is a question you know but how could we fight the terrors of uh, 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 you know uh, modernity with many problems unless we we go back perhaps to forms of sensitivity which in their fragility could advocate a different spirit okay these flowers are uh, you know too literal and too explicit and too sweet but maybe in their fragility flowers could defend us now we go to a different kind of architect who was also born today but a different year a, a dutchman and again the dutch are flying high in architecture an architect who is not well known but he deserves to be known jan dwicker 1890-1935 so he lived five years longer than pugin pugin died at 40 jan dwicker died at 45 they both died young at least in architecture to die at 40 or 45 is to die young in poetry it's not like this 
to die at 40, I exaggerate a little bit, but uh, in poetry to die at 40 is to die old. Uh, anyway, uh, here he was, here he was an interesting architect and you are going to see some interesting uh, uh, modern buildings that he built, plus the collaboration with Charot for the famous Maison de Verre, the house, the glass house built in Paris. So Jan Duiker, uh, born on March 1st in The Hague uh, in 1890. So he, he was born about 40, 38, uh, year, 38 years later um, uh, from the death of uh, Pugin. And I mean, uh, before the Second World War started, started was a Dutch architect, partnership with Bernard uh, Bichauvet from 1919 until 1925. For the commission of the Zonestral project, the architects were recommended by Henry Verlache, a great architect, about whom I talked a few days a few days earlier. Uh, this architect left the Netherlands in 1925. I mean, his partner, to work whose name I have difficulties to pronounce, and I apologize. Left the left the Netherlands in 1925 to work in Paris with Pierre Charot for projects such as Maison de Verre at all. Jan Dwicker is one of the most important, important, um, I'm a little bit confused because here it says uh, this Bernard uh, uh, left the Netherlands uh, for the, but I thought uh, Jan Dwicker did too. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe his partner uh, left to work for Pierre Charot. I have to double check this. I thought that actually Jan Duiker uh, worked with, uh, with uh, Pierre Charot, but it's possible I'm wrong. His partner did so. I apologize. So uh, he died in, 19, uh, in, 18, in 1935 and he's buried in this uh, Zorkville uh, Cemetery. Townhouses in the, in the Hague, 1919-1922. Um, you know, they have sloping roofs, but there is something about them. So let's read again, 1919, uh, 1922, we remember in 1919, the Bauhaus was born from an exalted spirit of Walter Gropius. Um, these buildings also, in my opinion, have a, a, a vigorous modernity about them, despite, uh, you know, so-called traditional roofing. Now, another residential area with villas, 1921, 1923, uh, you know, rather modest houses, perhaps nothing exceptional here, uh, except the car, I'm joking, of course. Uh, and uh, again, rather unexceptional buildings, but we are going to see different architect architectures from him. Although something interesting is happening here too, because there is, uh, I know, I don't know if the building was not uh, refurbished and changed certain things, you know, like the, the larger, you know, uh, you know, doors and, uh, you know, the windows, but otherwise the building is uh, in good measure, you know, rather so-called traditional. That's what he built. Now another house from 1924, 1925, so almost 100 years ago, all of a sudden modernity, abruptly so. And I actually salute it in as much as I like the ornaments and the, the sensitivity of Augustus Pugin. I also like this modernity and I understand in a way the reaction of this modernity to you know, maybe at times uh, they became excesses of the uh, turn of the century, at the end of the 19th century. Anyway, this is a building that, uh, yes, is presented in the series of great buildings, as you can see. Let's look at it again. And it was built before uh, Villa Savoie, which was built in 1928. This was built in 1924, 1925. Jan Duiker. It's 
it's amazing in a way now that in uh, just uh, one or two years he arrived at such architecture after before doing this incredible transformation isn't it showing again the 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 the, the appreciable flexibility of mind uh, the dutch have they are indeed open to the new and it's shown even here uh, this was built almost 100 years ago but uh, it's a building which even today would be considered contemporary so to speak or modern a sanatorium from 1926-1928 nomination for unesco world heritage uh, look at this so it was uh, built uh, again before before villa savoie and its modernity is for all to see it's a clean modernity here if i am to use the word clean uh, there are things here that no one would contest that they belong to our time to our beloved modernity it's quite a good building actually and i understand why unesco is considering uh, you know uh, bringing it to the list of uh, protected building i don't know if it received that status but uh, it's a luminous uh, building that deserves uh, deserves appreciation no doubt and i i'm glad that it was uh, you know uh, taken care of it is an excellent building very different of course from what we saw by pugin but excellence is excellence and we have to take our hats off in front of excellence yes there is a lot of glass but 100 years ago there wasn't concern any concern with um, the climate change uh, losses of energy and so on jan duiker sanatorium we also remember the paimio sanatorium by uh, by alvar alto and uh, the, his uh, wife uh, they both did uh, great work there and here is jan duiker i guess uh, in this field uh, um, you know some important buildings were uh, were erected that one also by uh, the I alto family uh, was built in, in in nature surrounded by trees and so on and yes it is appropriate for a sanatorium to if possible to to have the proximity of the ever generous trees we should be immensely grateful that there are trees in the world and should we should abstain from cutting any we shouldn't cut any tree they do us a great service in their humble way. Look how it was the building. So, you know, here is the loving care of those who decided to protect it. And, and, um, and I'm very glad they did. Once this building was like this. Villa Savoie itself at one moment it was... Um, uh, it was uh, almost like this anyway uh, <laughs> bernard chumi said uh, in he, one of his uh, publicities for architecture that the most architectural thing about the villa savoie was the state of decay it was in and i would understand why chumi wrote this malicious uh, statement nirwana residential building in the hague 1928 1930 even this building you know it's uh, it has vigor in its uh, prismatic uh, you know uh, monolithical uh, way it's obviously jan duiker was a, a talented uh, architect
And look at the car and look at the building. The car is obsolete, although the nostalgics would, uh, would still love it, but in a different way than the building. The building still has a, an appreciable uh, amount of so-called modernity. Now, an open-air school in Amsterdam South, 1929, 1930. Um, I hope I have better pictures. Yes, I do. This one also is well taken care of. And we see echoes of the sanatorium he built. Again, an excellent architecture, modern, clean, white, luminous, with glass. But you see the glass has character because it is divided into smaller parts it's not the same glass that we use today, where we just use a huge piece of glass that is undivided in smaller uh, parts. No, this one, this one, uh, I think, makes a subtle clean day towards the past because of because the past didn't have such uh, huge glassy pieces of glass as we have today. And this uh, this uh, can also accommodate uh, accommodate windows that open and so on. I find them more humane. I'm usually a kind of an adversary of glass, but not like this. Um, this is, I hope I have the plan here because it's rather interesting, the plan of this um, open air as it is called. Why is it called open air school? Because there are this in the corner, huge terraces. So I imagine they had classes that took place on the terrace in open air. Bravo to them. Yes, look at the plan. The idea to have these uh, large terraces for open air um, lessons or classes is very, very nice. I think, and uh, you know, it's a building within the city. It didn't benefit from a large space around it. So it provided space upstairs for classes um, in open air. And any anything in open air, I think, is uh, is uh, an attempt to bring us closer to what is not us. That is, you know, nature or the so-called environment and so on. I like the plan, you know, and it, it has the rotation, it has dynamic qualities, although it is based on the square. It's a simple scheme, but but uh, I think it is valid. Here is a model. At night. The ample terraces maybe are not so easily uh, perceivable, but uh, you saw them in the plan. They, they are quite uh, ample. They are from here, from this world to, to this world. So the idea to have, uh, you know, uh, open spaces that are uh, large uh, is, I think, uh, good. And maybe this, this, this could be uh, used uh, for various programs. Maybe even for bureaucratic uh, uh, buildings, you know, uh, to 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 break the, you know, the monotonous, uh, you know, self-satisfied, uh, uh, you know, uh, divorce between us and the outside, and to use all that paraphernalia of protection that uh, Lerem Kohl has talked about. So here are again some drawings uh, with the with the with the plans and sections of the section of the building. Jan Duiker, Amsterdam, Amsterdam South. This is a resolute modernity which even today looks fresh and almost radical. I would say. Excellent work. Bravo to him. So very different from what Augustus Pugin advocated and did, but still excellent.
a very simple scheme, but uh, efficient and uh, eloquent as well. A technical school from 1930 to 1931. We remember he died in 1935. So unfortunately, we are not too far away from the year when he died. Jan Duiker. You see, this is what you cannot do with a large piece of glass, uh, just a single large piece of glass. But if you have smaller, uh, you know, if it is divided, the large glass surface in smaller parts, yes, you can open, if not the whole of it, parts of it. And this is important. Now, here we see uh, uh, glass bricks. Uh, that were also used in that Maison de Verre, where at least uh, his uh, former partner worked, but I have to verify this. I thought it was Jan Duiker who uh, collaborated with Pierre Charot. I will end this presentation with uh, some images from uh, Maison de Verre, even if uh, Jan Duiker himself didn't work for it, but his former partner did. And uh, it's an important building. and. Uh, We'll see the uh, also the, the the use of, of uh, glass bricks uh, quite uh, quite well and quite extensively. Another, I would say, excellent building uh, built by Jan Duiker, 1930. Again, uh, glass uh, glass bricks. Why is it that the Dutch have so many great architects and designers? I keep asking myself, an artist, what is about this nation? I mean, almost every day I discover a new architect and even in the present they have famous and less famous, excellent architects and designers and artists. What is it? Maybe it helps to live under the level of the sea, at least uh, one third of the country. Maybe it helps. Those who are fortunate to live above, uh, less inclined to uh, achieve excellence in uh, intellectual or artistic fields, it seems. I guess I could understand this in a way. So here is a perspectival drawing of this building that we just saw. And uh, even here, you know, there are very interesting things. Again, this is a building built 90 years ago that today would be very relevant for us in the 21st century, yes. It didn't grow old, it didn't. Oh yes, it's not uh, Gothic revival architecture, no far from it, but I would like to think that Pugin would have appreciated in as much as I would like to think that Jan Duiker would have appreciated what Pugin stood for, because I think excellence is beyond style. A cinema in Amsterdam, we are approaching the end, 1934, uh, building in the corner of the street. Uh, this is a view at night. And you will see also the plan, an interesting, a difficult uh, context um, in terms of, um, the urban uh, context within which it found itself. I hope I have the plan. Uh, it's it's a cinema. It's a it's a place for uh, watching movies, and uh, the building itself, you know, without this big announcement, uh, is as it is. It would have still had some dignity in its simplicity, but the rhetorics of this huge. Uh, naming uh, uh, makes it, uh, you know, uh, indeed uh, somehow constructivist in the sense of some utopian uh, uh, proposals made by the Russian architects at the beginning of the 20th century. So you can, for certain programs, uh, create uh, something spectacular, even with means, uh, not intrinsically, um, uh, you know, relating to what we call architecture, 
look at the plan. You know, it's it's really a difficult. I hope I was yes here. You see better. So here there is the intersection between two streets, and very interestingly, he solved that uh, you know the 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 you know the the needs uh, the functional needs for a cinema. I, I actually uh, am intrigued both by the the plans and the physicality of the building. Again, a, a skillful architect, uh, Jan, Jan Duiker. Well, from the, the outside, you wouldn't really expect this plan. You wouldn't really expect, you know, the diagonal uh, organization of spaces. But uh, I think he solved it rather unusually and interestingly, the, the problem he, because here was, uh, I imagine, an existing building and here uh, another existing building. So he squeezed his uh, cinema in between these two buildings in the corner in a, in a working way. Interesting building. Jan Duiker. And the cinema it is for all to see. And we see here the tensions between, uh, you know, the right angle, uh, rectangularity and then uh, the distortions, the disjunctions that uh, di the diagonal uh, provoked. And somehow he negotiated between the, them uh, very creatively. And the bikes, the Dutch bikes. We can learn from the, from the Dutch to all use bikes, bikes and bikes again. The bike is the vehicle of the future, in my opinion. Maybe if Mr. Bush would have uh, used the bike and uh, those who provoked the war in Iraq for oil, maybe they would have abstained from, uh, from provoking it. And uh, what can I say? I am hoping, I was hoping, I am hoping, I would be hoping that Mr. Putin would take the bike too. Because when you bike, maybe you become less aggressive towards other countries in the horrid ways in which he manifests his so-called masculinity. A winter department store in Amsterdam, 1934-1935. We remember he died in 1935. Um, I don't know if it still exists. Um, I, Amsterdam was more lucky in the Second World War than Rotterdam. Uh, Rotterdam was destroyed in good measure, in, well, in sad measure by uh, the Second World War, but Amsterdam was not. But it's possible some buildings either were demolished or, or they suffered in the war as well. I only have this picture of this building. Then here is a... Uh, from this year, famous actually series of books on great architects, one issue dedicated to Jan, uh, Jan Duiker. Now, a hotel and theater in, uh, in uh, Hilversum finished by the other architect, who apparently was the one who worked with um, uh, Pierre Charot for uh, the La Maison de Verre, the glass house, which will end this presentation. So they uh, worked together, but this, uh, his partner finished it in 1936, because as we know, he died in 1935. Grand Hotel, well, grand, uh, not vertically, who knows, maybe in terms of comfort, I don't know. But the architecture is still uh, that uh, clean, uh, white, luminous uh, um, modernity that he promoted. Uh, in his uh, short, uh, rather short career. Jan Duiker. Called the constructivist. Yes, I guess we could. Not a bad building either, this one.
I mean, the staircase often is, uh, is uh, an eventful uh, you know, entity within uh, almost any architecture, in, in this case, uh, equally so. A grand hotel, but it's not grand in that rhetorical, emphatic, uh, even arrogant way. No, I don't even know why it is called the grand hotel. And some uh, graphic work that he did, I don't know if for this hotel. And now I want to show because I thought he actually worked, but it seems his partner worked with Pierre Charot. Sorry about this. The Maison de Verre in Paris. It's maybe now the moment since his partner, but maybe he worked too. I have to double check. But even if he didn't, you know, the connection is through his partner, who in fact finished the previous work because he died in 1935. This is a famous building by usually associated with, I mean, uh, the author is considered Pierre Charot, um, was actually a designer. And then, uh, you know, he received commissions in architecture. He left the France and went to the United States. But in Paris, he built this important building called La Maison de Verre different from uh, the glass house, for example, by uh, Philip Johnson, very different. This is the house of a doctor. So there is also an office, you know, a medical office for this doctor within the house. You see the, the glass bricks. And yes, uh, there is something uh, enticing and valid about glass, glass, uh, glass bricks. Uh, even it seems that this Dutch architect who worked with um, with Pierre Charot and was the partner of um, Jan uh, Duker was quite skillful, and apparently his influence on the project of the Maison de Verre was higher than initially was acknowledged. There are very interesting things happening here. You know, just just look at the mechanism of opening the windows and the combination between mobile windows and the static windows uh, done with the um, uh, uh, glass bricks. Interesting work and very well designed indeed. Uh, and uh, it, it, yeah, it is a work which deserves to be known. Yes, Pierre Charot didn't quite work like this. So it's possible that the Dutch architect he worked with uh, had a significant uh, impact on the project. A lot of elegance and subtlety in, uh, in, uh, in, in this house. I mean, in its architecture. An impressive library, which I wish I had. And the building itself is, uh, is um, commanding respect, if not affection, but I would say affection as well. La Maison de Verre, the glass house. And books are always uh, a nice addition to any house and any life. That's it. So let's wish him happy birthday. And uh, today we pay the homage to Pugin and uh, Jan Duiker. Uh, thank you for being here today.